Hello. Welcome to the online service of Shore Presbyterian Church. It's good to have you worship, worshiping with us. If uh, you're watching this in quote-unquote real time, um, soon after it was recorded and uploaded, uh, I have a prayer request for you. Um, our denomination's slogan is that we are faithful to the scriptures, true to the reformed faith, and obedient to the Great Commission. And part of being obedient to the Great Commission is to emphasize a, a missional initiative, uh, specifically the initiative to plant churches. The statistics say that more people are converted to Christianity through the ministry of church plants than by any other means. And, uh, and so it's something that I've taken to heart, uh, something that I care about, and I will be attending our denomination's Mission to North America Church Planting Summit for the next three days. So I ask that you would please pray for me, um, for my travels, but also for me and the other ministers there who will be brainstorming and discussing the future of church planting in our denomination. So please pray for that. And, and, and I'll pray for that now even um, as we pray for our time in the scriptures. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we recognize that you are sovereign over all things. Um, you have promised that there is no one who will slip out of your grasp if you have chosen them to be your child. And yet you have chosen your church to be the ones who go and fulfill this great commission to make disciples, um, baptizing them and teaching them to obey. And, and so, Lord, we ask that you would bless uh, the PCA. We, we pray that you would bless the initiatives of Mission to North America, uh, a branch of our denomination. Um, we ask that you would bless me and the other uh, pastors who will be praying and um, thinking and brainstorming and sharing together um, to, to plan the future of our denomination when it comes to church planting around North America and beyond. Lord, also meet us today in the scriptures. Um, teach us more of who you are so that we might be a reflection of your grace and your mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we got into the actual commitment part of the covenant renewal ceremony that God's people have been partaking in over the last couple of chapters of Nehemiah. And they made this, this commitment after they had received the grace of God, who this grace which had returned them from exile and helped them rebuild their temple and the walls of their city. And in thinking about this commitment um, that they were making, it struck me that this commitment was pretty serious. It was a tall order, and it made me think of another commitment that I've heard that I wanted to share with you. This is the, the Navy SEALs ethos or philosophy. It's a, it's a commitment to being something different. L listen to it. In times of war or uncertainty, there is a special breed of warrior ready to answer our nation's call, common citizens with uncommon desire to succeed. Forged by adversity, they stand alongside America's finest special operations forces to serve their country, the American people, and protect their way of life. I am that warrior. My trident is a symbol of honor and heritage, bestowed upon me by the heroes that have gone before. It embodies the trust of those I have sworn to protect. By wearing the trident, I accept the responsibility of my chosen profession and way of life. It is a privilege that I must earn every day. My loyalty to country and team is beyond reproach. I humbly serve as a guardian to my fellow Americans, always ready to defend those who are in, unable to defend themselves. I do not advertise the nature of my work nor seek recognition for my actions. I voluntarily accept the inherent hazards of my profession, placing the welfare and security of others before my own. I serve with honor on and off the battlefield, the ability to control my emotions and my actions, regardless of circumstance, sets me apart from others. Uncompromising integrity is my standard. 
My character and honor are steadfast. My word is my bond. We expect to lead and be led. In the absence of orders, I will take charge, lead my teammates, and accomplish the mission. I lead by example in all situations. I will never quit. I persevere and thrive on adversity. My nation expects me to be physically harder and mentally stronger than my enemies. If knocked down, I will get back up every time. I will draw on every remaining ounce of strength to protect my teammates and to accomplish our mission. I am never out of the fight. We demand discipline. We expect innovation. The lives of my teammates and the success of our mission depend on me. My technical st skill, tactical proficiency, and attention to detail. My training is never complete. We train for war and fight to win. I stand ready to bring the full spectrum of combat power to bear in order to achieve my mission and the goals established by my country. The execution of my duties will be swift and violent when required, yet, yet guided by the, the very principles that I serve to defend. Brave seals have fought and died, building the proud tradition and feared reputation that I am bound to uphold. In the worst of conditions, the legacy of my teammates steadies my resolve and silently guides my every deed. I will not fail. Kind of kind of gives you chills to hear that, doesn't it? This, this commitment that the Navy SEALs are making to their country and to their comrades, it's inspiring. But it's also a really tall order. It, it, it calls for a, a complete change of lifestyle. It, it, it's a change in the way that they think, the way that they act, and even the way that they feel. In certain situations, they are called upon to, to behave in a way that, <laughs> that normal people cannot. And the commitment that we are called upon, the commitment that we as Christians must accept in our lives, is just as daunting. We are called to to think and act and feel differently in light of being made into new creations through Christ. Now, before we get all Navy SEALs about our mentality, about our spiritual commitment to God, let me remind us that our commitment is not a pull yourselves up by your bootstraps commitment. It's also not a violent <laughs> commitment. It, this is a commitment um, that is not of sheer willpower in the face of adversity, although it is a commitment of willpower. But it is also a commitment which is supernaturally empowered by the Holy Spirit and motivated by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. We have been saved first and foremost. We were dead and we were made alive First, we received the good news of God's saving love before we were ever asked to do anything. But now that we are alive, we have a need, a need to live for something greater than ourselves. We recognize that by becoming a member of the body of Christ, we are called to something higher. We are called to be different from other men and women. Like the seals, we are called to be set apart from the world around us. We are called to a higher and an eternal purpose. And, and we will see in our passage today that our purpose is to participate in worshiping and in spreading the worship of the one true and holy God. And we're looking in our text specifically at verses 30 through 39 today of chapter 10 in Nehemiah. But when I read, I'm going to start with verse 28 just to remind us of the context of this commitment. And that context is <clears throat> that the people of God in Jerusalem are committing to keep the whole law of God, which was given to Moses. It consists of the first five books of the Bible. But here, in these final verses, we see certain specific commitments that were highlighted. 
in this covenant renewal. Now, maybe these were trouble areas or places that they especially needed to focus on. It, it's hard to say why these particular things were, were the ones that were pulled out of those five books and listed here as things that they were committing to. But they were important enough to list out rather than just assume as part of the whole of God's law. Now again, as I mentioned last week, when we look at these commitments, we run the risk of zooming in too much and only seeing law and legalism. We might be tempted to see this as imperative before indicative, a covenant of works, so to speak. But our God does not call his people to legalism. These people we see in our text today are people who have been redeemed. They have tasted the sweetness of the covenant of grace. They have seen God's love for them, and they have fallen in love with him. They are committing to living life the way that their loving God knows is best for them. They aren't trying to earn God's favor by promising to keep the law. They already have God's favor. And his favor has moved them to seek after their loving God and to live according to his direction. So as we read this text, listen for principles of how God is guiding us to live our best lives in service to him out of motivation that is spurred by his awesome grace. Again, we're in Nehemiah 10. We're going to start at verse 28 and go through verse 39. God has something to say to you today. Hear it and apply it. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his rules and his statutes. And here's where we get specific. We will not give our daughters to the people of the land or take their daughters for our sons. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. We also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of God, for the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. We, the priests, the Levites, and the people have likewise cast lots for the wood offering to bring it into the house of God according to our father's houses at times appointed year by year to burn on the altar of the Lord of our God as it is written in the law. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord also to bring to the house of our God, to the priests who minister in the house of, God, of our God, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks, and to bring the first of our dough and our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine and the oil to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring to the Levites the tithes from the ground, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our towns where we, where we labor. And the priests, the sons of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers. We will not neglect the house of our God.
This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. And we're going to focus in on the things that the people and their leaders decided were important enough to mention specifically. Things that were important enough to commit to. And there are a bunch here, but they can be grouped into three categories, which I've titled Commit to Being a Holy People, Commit to Keeping a Holy Day, and Commit to Maintaining a Holy Practice of Worship. Now, each of these specific things could have an entire Sunday school class taught about them. And I'm always tempted to kind of lean more into teaching than preaching, but a sermon format only permits a, a brief flyover. So if you'd like to talk about any of these topics in more depth, I'm more than happy to meet with you to do that. But let's jump in and start by talking about how the people of God responded to God's grace by deciding to commit to being a holy people. Now, the, this idea of committing to be a holy people comes mostly from verse 30, where it says, We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. Now, since I've talked about this idea previously, I will refer you to my other sermons in this series, which are available on, on YouTube. They focus on the fact that this might sound discriminatory in a racial or nationalistic way, but it's really focused on a religious purity. In fact, in verse 28 of our passage today, we get a picture of people who have separated themselves from the people of the land to the, the law of God. They have turned away from something and turned towards something. They have repented. And, and this is most likely picturing proselytes or converts from paganism, people with ethnic differences who were welcomed in as Israelites because they confer, converted to the worship of Yahweh. You see, ethnic diversity is a thing of beauty, which was always meant to be reflected among God's people and in holy marriages. So that's not what they are swearing off. Instead, by setting themselves apart from and refusing to intermarry with the people of the land, God's people are trying to avoid contaminating the worship of Yahweh with pagan idols. Now, as the custom of that time, when a man and a woman married, for each of them to bring their respective gods into their home and to give them a place of prominence. Now, of course, in, in the worship of Yahweh, there were no graven images that could be brought in, and, and there was to be no other god tolerated in his presence. So this just cannot be. Now, we may be beyond polytheistic beliefs in our day and age. We might not have graven statues of gods in our homes. But we do have a tendency to fall into syncretism. Now, syncretism is the blending of the worship of the true God with the worship of other gods, idols, or, or, or created things, or even ideas. And there are many examples of this, but, but some that are more prevalent in the U.S. are materialism, the lust for wealth and comfort, which Jesus talked more about as a temptation than even sexual immorality. Then there's also another form of materialism, which is the loss of belief among so-called Christians in the spiritual and supernatural due to intellectualism and scientific theory. And then there's thirdly, individualism, the loss of the communal aspects of our faith. And then nationalism, the blending of piety and patriotism. When Jesus called us to obey our leaders, yes, but to seek first his kingdom. Now, of course, there could be a sermon on each of those syncretistic temptations, but we must move on and we leave them merely as examples for us to ponder in our own time of how we might be succumbing to a culture, a cultural pressure to pollute or dilute our faith. Now in our scripture, we see that in order to prevent that type of pollution and dilution uh, of our faith, that it, it, that it was important to marry someone who shares your deepest beliefs, the beliefs in the gospel. This is a principle which has carried over into the New Testament, 
If a, if a man and his wife are not united in the worship of God, how could their marriage be a reflection of the relationship between God and his people? James Hamilton Jr. comments about this idea, saying, This requirement is not merely a box that we want to check, as though a believing spouse settles the matter. We want to pursue what this points to. We want to cultivate wonderful marriages so that our marriages will display Christ's love for the church and the church's submission to Christ. You see, by both spouses loving and serving the one true God, you have a better chance that your relationship will mirror God's love and commitment to a world that so desperately is lacking in those areas. And, and having a holy family leads to worship of the holy God, which is the commitment which seems to take up most of the space in our text today, this idea of worshiping a holy God. Now, ultimately, we are to be holy, to reflect and to worship a holy God. We must be committed enough to our God that we would make this kind of decision, the, the kind of decision where we will only marry someone who shares our faith, even when that decision is difficult, even when we may have feelings for someone who doesn't share our faith. That's a hard thing, and it requires a deep commitment. Now, there are other concepts that come out of this idea of being people set apart. In fact, there have been so many lists, if you'll remember, lists of of names in this Ezra Nehemiah scroll that just seems like list after list after list. But the reason that there are these lists is because it was important to determine who is a holy, set apart member of the covenant and who is not. Now, <clears throat> how do they do this besides keeping lists, right? Especially lists of family heads who will be the ones who guide their families in the way of faith. And, and I think we see from, from this idea, at least obliquely, that church membership matters. If we are truly a diverse church of God, made up of people from different nations, different ethnicities, and different cultures, how do we know who is in, who is a covenant member, and who is not? Do we all just wear matching t-shirts? No, we have lists. This is, this is why we have church roles. This is why we make vows as covenant members. It, it's important for many reasons, but here we see that maintaining a line of distinction is important for the protection of God's people and for our witness to a watching world. You see, we have a credentialing process for our pastors and elders. And we have vows for our members to make sure that we as a church remain religiously pure. And finally, I'll tease an idea that will be unpacked a little bit more in our third point, which is that even though this passage revolves around temple worship, there is a sense in which we are now the house of God. The church is the body of Christ. And our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. We must be a people set apart because we are the dwelling place of the holy God on earth. He used to dwell in a tabernacle, a tent, and then a temple, and most fully in Christ himself. But now his spirit dwells in us, his church. And as Paul says, we are members of of Christ. Would we unite members of Christ to a prostitute? Never. We are not our own. We were bought with a price. And so for this reason, we should commit to being a holy people. But our text tells us that we should also commit to keeping a holy day. Verse 31 picks up on another area of holiness that the people wanted to focus on. Listen. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them 
on the Sabbath or on a holy day, and we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. Now, in this single verse, there are actually three laws that are being mentioned. The first is the Sabbath, which is the last of seven days. Since creation, it was to be set aside for rest and not for pursuing one's means of living. Specifically here, we see that the people felt convicted to not only refrain from doing their own business, but also from doing business with unbelievers. I call this the Chick-fil-A principle, and we'll talk about why this might apply to us in a minute. But the next two laws here are laws um, for what is known as the sabbatical year. So on the seventh year in a series of seven year in a rotation, the people were told, um, one, to let their fields lay fallow. They were not to farm the land. Uh, and, and we now have scientific reasons that support why we should let fields lay fallow for a year, or at the very least, why we should rotate our crops and not you know, farm the same crop in the same field year after year. But for the Israelite, this was a matter of trust. The fruit of one's field was their very livelihood. To let a field lay fallow was a huge risk. They had to trust that God would provide for them despite the resting of this field. Also on sabbatical years, debts were to be forgiven. If your fellow Israelite owed you money because you had made a loan to them, you could not collect. Uh, th there are some scholars who debate if this means completely wiping out the debt or if it just means not collecting during that sabbatical year. Either way, this was an incredible test of faith for the creditor and a new lease on life for the debtor. So we see grace in that. Now, few things test commitment like the Sabbath and the sabbatical laws. Now, in all of these examples, we see the principle of trusting God to provide for you despite the fact that you aren't leveraging everything at your disposal. Rest one day a week instead of working. Well, that's a day of profit loss. Rest your fields for a year. Can you imagine surviving with no product for an entire year or only the product that was left over from the year before? And can you imagine not collecting on your loans for an entire year or even canceling them altogether? We would think that that would put someone out of business. But God promised to provide for his people if they trusted him and obeyed these laws. Now the question for us New Testament Christians is which of these Old Testament laws apply to us? Well, we know that the ceremonial laws for Israel were fulfilled in Christ and that, that it's only the moral laws which remain in effect for us today. So are these laws ceremonial or moral? Well, I would argue that these Sabbaths, which is the fourth commandment in the Ten Commandments, is a moral law, which applies to us until Christ returns. The sabbatical year and the other Sabbaths, like the Day of Atonement, um, the new moons and festivals, are all ceremonial laws and fulfilled by Christ. Now, I don't have time to make a full explanation. I'm willing to talk about it offline. But for the sake of transparency, I do want to make you aware of some New Testament texts, you can jot these down and look them up later, which have caused this issue to become one that is hotly debated. And those texts are Romans 14, 5 and 6, and Colossians 2, 16 and 17. My synopsis of the argument is this. When Sabbaths, plural, are mentioned in conjunction with new moons and festivals, the author, whether it be Paul or Nehemiah, and by the way, if you look at our text today in verse 33, you see this grouping of words. When this grouping is used, the person is speaking of holy day Sabbaths, like the Day of Atonement. In fact, if you go to Leviticus 23 and read about the Day of Atonement, you will see that it is referred to 
as a Sabbath of holy rest, even if that Day of Atonement falls on any day of the week, all right? It doesn't have to fall on a Saturday. Now, Paul in Colossians calls these days shadows of things to come, meaning that they were fulfilled in Christ, and we have our rest in him. But the Sabbath, on the other hand, it was first ordained during the creation. Just like marriage, this creation mandate was given for all mankind, whether believer or unbeliever. But for believers, it was canonized into moral law in the Ten Commandments. And these Ten Commandments are the summary of the moral law of God, about which Jesus said, not one jot or tittle shall pass away, meaning it's still in effect. And when I say that these laws are in effect, I mean that they reveal to us the character of our God and direct us how we should go in order to live our God-given lives to the fullest. We're not saved by our keeping of the law. We're saved by grace. But the law is good to point us towards how we ought to live. And, and, and even if some of these moral laws from the Old Testament point to Christ in some way, which of course they would because they're about him and his character, they also point to how we ought to live in this world now as New Testament believers. And so the application for us is that we too should be committed to the Sabbath principle. We should set aside one day in seven for rest and for worship. This is a healthy and righteous thing to do. We should probably also try to refrain from doing business with unbelievers because even if they aren't worshiping, they should be resting according to the creation mandate. And this means that we, we probably shouldn't go to restaurants on Sundays except in cases of necessity. Chick-fil-A is right. <laughs> we shouldn't do that. Christ did, however, tell the Pharisees that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, which means that in Christ we have freedom to do works of necessity and mercy on the Sabbath. We don't have to refrain from all work all the time. We have to use a gospel perspective to decide when it's, it's right and wrong to do these things. Uh, we are not to become legalistically enslaved to the Sabbath. So for example, let me give you um, a, a picture of that. Uh, people become injured or ill on the Sabbath. It is good and right for medical professionals to work on the Sabbath to necessarily and mercifully aid these ailing people. And I, I would, however, encourage those medical professionals to try to set aside one day in seven for rest, even if it can't be the same day that most Christians set aside for rest and worship. But with that said, most Christians set aside the first day of the week to be the Christian Sabbath, even though that is a change from the Jewish practice of setting aside the seventh day. Now, this is um, different from the creation mandate, admittedly. The, it was the seventh day uh, which, on which God rested in the creation story. Um, but we do have reasons for moving it to the first day. First and foremost, this is the day that our Lord was raised from the dead. Revelations 1.10, Revelation 1.10, refers to a Lord's Day. Um, and many believe this refers to the day of our Lord's resurrection as being a Sunday. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16 and Acts 20 seem to point to the fact that the early church gathered to worship on the first day of the week instead of on the seventh. Now granted, this is not one of those issues over which someone should fall on their sword. But the vast majority of Christendom has accepted Sundays as the day on which we should rest and the day on which we should gather for worship. So for convenience sake, at the very least, it makes sense that this is the day that we should set aside because the scripture, scripture is clear in Hebrews, and I think in our text today as well, that we should not neglect meeting together. 
we should be very committed to corporate worship. You see, corporate worship is a large part of our faith. And having studied through the Ezra-Nehemiah scroll, we should now see how important corporate worship of our God is and how vital it is to our flourishing and to our identity. So I think it's fair to say that we should make a commitment to meeting together weekly, to worship God and to be together, encouraging each other, not just when we feel like it. It should be a commitment of a follower of Christ to meet together weekly, one day out of seven, to worship together and be encouraged together. Now this appeal could be made much more scripturally involved, but for now I think it's sufficient to challenge us to devote our Sundays to rest and worship. Now the other two aspects here, um, they fall into the category of ceremonial law, uh, which has been fulfilled in Christ. Therefore, there isn't a direct command that we must obey like there is with the keeping of the Sabbath. However, there are principles which we can apply. And there are two principles that I believe stand out. The first is the principle of trust. For the Sabbath, or for the sabbatical year, we're trusting that God will provide even though we take time away from providing for ourselves. Now this should move us away from our materialism or our workaholism, um, and it should move us to trust in God. Second, the sabbatical year shows a spirit of charity or generosity towards our brothers. All right, So we had um, a spirit of trust, and now we have a spirit of charity or generosity, because it shows that we ought to cancel debts, or at their very least, um, delay collection on those debts. We should be generous enough to cancel our brother's debts, whether they be financial debts or whether they be debts of sin, meaning we should forgive them, right? And, and I think we see a parallel um, to this idea from a story about the Great Awakening, which was a revival that happened in our country in the 1740s. Now, at the height of the Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards, a, an Anglican minister in Northampton, Massachusetts, called for a day of fasting and prayer and, and a day of owning a covenant. Okay, so do you see the parallel to our text today? He's kind of calling them to a covenant renewal, just like these people are doing. And, and so he, he assembled his people at a meeting house and in a solemn ceremony, all the people assented to a document of commitment. They acknowledged God's grace, they asked for forgiveness, and then they agreed to an elaborate set of promises. The, the largest section of those promises dealt with how Christian neighbors should live together. And, and here, I'm going to read to you a description that, of that section that was put together by um, Jonathan Edwards' biographer, uh, George Marsden. And I believe this observance puts into practice the principles of charity that we see in that forgiveness of debts in the sabbatical year. He says, Those who defraud their neighbor in any way promised not only to change their ways, but that we will not rest till we have made that restitution or given that satisfaction which the rules of moral equity require. Further, everyone promised to renounce backbiting, a spirit of revenge, enmity, ill will, and secret grudges, particularly in public affairs. They agreed to give up their notorious party spirit and to avoid all unchristian invades. Yeah, I had to look that up too. It means committing libel or slander, talking bad or writing badly about someone. Um, reproachings and bitter reflections, judging and ridiculing others, either in public meetings or in private conversations. Now, man, in our political climate these days, couldn't we do with some charity like that? The fact that they covenanted to give up their notorious party spirit in order to treat their neighbors better. It's a wonderful picture of gospel love to me. You know, during this revival, they recognized that God had called them to something higher than political parties. 
He had called them to love their neighbor and in doing so effectively and winsomely to draw their neighbor to worship the God who had made them, them as a people different from the world around them. I mean, it takes commitment to prioritize this kind of trust in God and this kind of care and charity for others. And this brings us to our final point. We should first commit to being a holy people, second, commit to keeping a holy day, and third, we should commit to maintaining a holy practice of worship. Verses 32 through 39 make up the bulk of our text today, and I unfortunately cannot give it the time it deserves, but these verses are summed up beautifully with the final statement of our chapter. We will not neglect the house of our God. It almost gives me the same chills I got when reading the, the commitment that the Navy SEALs make. Or, or when football players, when they're getting ready to, to play a home game, chant, We must protect this house! You know, here we see the people of God are committing to protect the house of God, to support the house of God. And in all these verses, the people are committing to maintaining a holy practice of worship according to God's law. Specifically, they committed to maintain the temple, which was the house of God at that time, and the ministry which took place at that temple. They committed to do this by financial and material offerings. Now again, I could do a whole sermon on Christian tithing and giving here, but I already have, so I'll just refer you to to that sermon in my YouTube archives. But let me just summarize by saying uh, that the parts of the law that require giving in certain amounts or percentages, those are part of the ceremonial law, and so they do not apply to us as New Testament Christians. Rather, the principle of generosity challenge us, challenges us to give even more sacrificially than what was required in the Old Testament law. Our generosity is not a, a requirement for God's favor, but a response to the generosity that he has displayed to us. So if you want to use the principle of tithing, 10%, to guide your giving, I say great. But should you stop there? Now, I'll also say that there are some in financial situations where it would be irresponsible of them to give 10% of their income to the work of ministry, but others would not be reflecting true gospel-inspired generosity if they gave only 10% away. And so we should be committed to caring for the church and her ministry, both financially and with our time and our talents. And while I don't have time to detail every verse in this passage, there are two details from these verses that I do want to highlight. The first is in verse 34. Look at verse 34. We, the priests, the Levites, and the people have likewise cast lots for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God according to our Father's houses at times appointed year by year to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. What is interesting about this verse is that it perfectly displays the principle of generosity and it displays an anticipation of needs for the worshiping community. And what I mean by that is that though this covenant renewal is to keep the law of Moses, there is nowhere in the law that mentions bringing offerings of firewood. It, it, it actually, when you read it here, you, you look back on the, the, the law of Moses and you think, man, what an oversight given the amount of burnt offerings that occur in the temple. In fact, I think when it says that it refers to the law, uh, according to the law, it's referring to Leviticus 6, which talks about how the fire should be kept burning perpetually. But it never addresses how the firewood is going to get there. And, and how are these sacrifices going to be made without firewood? And so this text is the first place where this issue is addressed in the Bible. And, and these recommitting believers saw a need a need that wasn't even mentioned in the law, and they vowed to meet that need 
because they valued the worship of their God. Permit me to draw a parallel to our church. The scriptures, even in the New Testament, do command us as followers of Christ to provide for the maintaining of worship. They even specifically talk about how the church should provide for the needs of the person or people who minister to them. And I would like to say that we as a church are in the 80 to 90 percent range for meeting our yearly budget without outside support, which is phenomenal given that we are a rural church and that we survived COVID. But the scriptures do not specifically mandate that you do any more than provide a salary for your minister. And yet, many people from this church saw a need. And even though it wasn't mandated in scripture, they thought, or at least I assume they thought, how can our minister and his wife do the work of ministry with only one car and a family of six? <laughs> and one car that won't even hold all six at once. You all, Shore Presbyterian Church, saw a need and you covenanted together to meet that need. Just like seeing a need for firewood on the altar, this church saw a need for transporting my family around to various ministry events. And this church generously contributed to meet that need. There are many people in this church who have already taken this principle of gospel generosity to heart. And I am personally in awe and cannot thank you enough. The second detail that I want to highlight, we see in verse 36. Look at verse 36, it says, Also to bring to the house of our God, to the priests who minister in the house of our God, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks. Now, of course, the firstborn of the cattle and the herds and the flocks, those are to be given, those are uh, to be turned over and given to be used as, as sacrifices at the temple. Um, Animals that were killed and their blood spread around for all the, uh, the rituals that are required in the law. But what may have caught you off guard, caught me off guard, is this pledging of the firstborn of our sons. <laughs> now don't freak out. They weren't sacrificing their children. Right? That was a pagan thing. Certainly not something that Yahweh would, would demand. And even when he did demand it that one time, he provided a substitute. Um... But what they're doing here instead of sacrificing them is they are they're bringing their firstborn son to the temple in a symbolic act as if to say, even my children belong to you, God. God has given us everything we have. All of our material wealth is a blessing from the Lord, and we are merely stewards of that blessing. But this act is to say that even our children have been given to us by God. They really and truly belong to him. And yet we have been entrusted to steward them, to bring them up according to God's word. If even our children are his, what do we have that isn't his? The answer is nothing. Everything, including our gifts and talents, even the things that we work hard at, really and truly belong to our Lord. And we, like this faithful remnant, ought to devote everything we have to his worship. We ought to be faithful stewards of his generosity to us. And everything that we have, including our own children and our own bodies, ought to be offered up to the Lord as his. You see, we live in a time when this temple that they had just rebuilt, has ceased to exist. It was destroyed again. But this is no tragedy, because Jesus has made his church the temple. No, there's no one special church building that needs to be supported. We, the people, the church, 
are the temple. And the New Testament scriptures talk about supporting the work of ministry that is done by the church. And, and, and that may include supporting a building if a local body of believers decides that having a building is necessary. But more importantly, we ought to think of devoting every last inch of our being to glorifying our God. We cannot have hidden closets of our lives which we keep from him. He gave us all by laying down his very life on a cross so that we might be redeemed. How much more should we lay down our lives, even our most secret parts, out of gratitude for his mercy and his sacrifice? You see, to be a true disciple of Christ means that we receive all the glorious inheritance that comes with being a child of God. But it also means that we ought to be willing to lay down every aspect of our existence in obedience to him. Now, I cannot say this enough, but our devotion and our commitment to God does not earn us anything from him. We have already received more than we could ever deserve from him. Our devotion and our commitment comes from the gratitude that his generosity has initiated within us. We obey and we worship our God because we love him, and we love him because he first loved us. So let us make a renewed commitment to love our Lord and Savior by obeying what he has commanded and giving every last inch of our lives and our micro kingdoms over to his rule and for his glory. Let us, like the Navy SEALs, commit to protecting not our nation, but the holiness of God's church. Let us prioritize personal holiness, gathering weekly to worship together and giving of ourselves to promote worship however we can. Let us say that we are God's warriors, whose word is our bond. Let us say that we are never out of the fight and that our training is never complete. But let us confess that we will fail, unlike the Navy Seals. But God will never fail us. And when we fail, God will redeem us and he will complete the good work that he began in us. And let that redemption continue to motivate you to be committed servants of the one true God. Amen? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, there is a lot of law in this passage, but it is law that is motivated by grace. It is a blessing that we have your word to guide us in the way that we should go, the way that leads to a flourishing life. Lord, you could have left us guessing, but you didn't. You saved us and you gave us your word to guide us. And so, Lord, we fail. <laughs> Help us in our unbelief. Help us in our failure. Help us, Lord to see the beauty of your grace and mercy upon us. Let that motivate us to be obedient to your word and to bring you glory and to make a commitment to being holy and to worshiping you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.